exclusively on the Business Outlaws Network. But, you know, everybody talks about taking care of the customer, but they don't live it like we, like we did and like we do. We do anything for, for one, any customer. And uh, I travel around so often and I see great service and I see terrible service. Mm-hmm. And we, we've always prided ourselves on, on taking care of people. And that's what young people, but, but sometimes people, they, they think it's beneath them to cater to somebody. Well, if you think it's beneath you to cater to somebody, you, you, better, you better become an accountant. For the call, we fight for the call. A circle of winners, a circle of winners. We're business outlaws, we're business outlaws. You know that we win it, we fight for the cause. A circle of winners, we're business outlaws. We're business outlaws. We're business outlaws. So the the premise here, Gavin, of this show is. Um, Mike and I have been in a lot of masterminds and we've, we've been friends for a long time, yep. always trying to get better in business and, you know, better as people. And, um, we've paid hundreds of thousands of dollars to be <clears throat> in masterminds. And one time we'd been at a, at a meeting and we went back to his house and we were like really frustrated because we're like, man, people just don't tell you the truth. They tell you the idealized version or what they want you to know. But a lot of times people don't tell you the truth about business. And then we got on the discussion. We're like, man, wouldn't it be cool if we could go back and tell the 24-year-old us, like, have 15 minutes and tell the truth about things that we've learned, you know, how it really works. Not the idealized version or the politically correct version, but, you know, things aren't always easy and hard decisions have to be made. So that's kind of the premise of this show, Business Outlaws, is for entrepreneurs. If we could go back to our 24-year-old self. What would you tell your 24-year-old self now, knowing what you know now, and you could have a conversation with your 24-year-old self, or, or even even younger? What would you tell that person? That's kind of what the, that's what the show's about. Okay, yeah. great. Because this is millennials. A lot of millennials right. listen to this. They want to become entrepreneurial, and they don't understand business, and they've got a different kind of slant on reality and what it really is, and this show's about telling them the truth. <clears throat> great. And then we're excited to have you because you have yeah. such a broad experience Man, in, in do different you ever. areas, good and bad. We've, we've been in just about everything. <laughs> yeah. Wow. So we have a, a lot of experience in so many different businesses. But right. So <clears throat> where where did it all start? Your your, your father had a, 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 a was a bottler a bottler. No, my my grandfather migrated here okay. to Las Vegas, New Mexico. Las Vegas. That's New the Mexico. original Las Vegas. Wow. What we say. Okay. And uh, he migrated from Lebanon and started a, a grocery store, a general store, general merchandising store, and they sold shoes and sugar. And yeah. Then he uh, ran into a gentleman that helped him with the stock market. He made some money in the stock market yeah. and vent- eventually got the uh, Coors distributorship for Las Vegas, New Mexico, a small town. Okay. Uh, eventually, he acquired Las Ve- uh, Coors for the inst- entire state of New Mexico, which back then yeah. was at the right after Prohibition or even before Prohibition, Coors was a hard sell. No one had ever heard of it. So he, he persevered, and he died at a young age, and my father took over and uh, eventually got as we got Coors for the entire state of Mexico, and then we got, also got into liquor. And so we were uh, Jack Daniels distributors, uh, Gallo, okay. uh, Bacardi, on and on and on. That's how okay. we really got started. Okay. So... You're in a normal business, and all of a sudden, you decide to buy a sports team. What was that like the first time you had? What was it like? I mean, what, what, what was you? You have a certain idea in your head about business, and you're used to running business a certain way. And now you have this professional team, and it's very different to run a professional team than a, a normal business. And what are those differences? Well, I, I remember reading if you want to go back, way back. Okay. You want to go way back? Sure. <laughs> okay. Well, we, uh, my father and I, and my brother Joe, we went, um, we went sports hunting, and so we went to, to look to buy a team. So we bought okay. the the, uh, the Houston Rockets in 1978. What'd you buy them for? Nine million. God. Yeah. Huh? Wow. Nine million. But remember, you have to consider the time and and mm-hmm. where it was. When we bought the Rockets, we actually, the, uh, when my dad unfortunately passed away in 1980, we went to the World Championship against the Celtics. That's when they had Larry Bird and Kevin McHale. Yeah, I'm going way sure. back. No, no, I remember. Everybody I, I remember watching them play. Everybody here is really young, so they probably yeah. won't remember all this. Yeah. But um, And we were on 
We were in the, the world championship tape delayed. Okay. It was at 12 o'clock at night. They didn't have, you know, it wasn't prime time back then. We well. used to call ourselves uh, not, not, no prime time players. Because we, we they they brought rebroadcasted at twelve o'clock at night, so it was okay. it wasn't big back then. To be honest with you, it wasn't wasn't okay. that so big. nine million was a lot then. Nine, nine million was a lot, yeah. And then yeah. So was, what do was. you what do you understand about that deal? Were you did you negotiate that deal when it happened, or were you in on it? Oh yeah, I was in on it. Yeah, I I just had. Uh, How does nine graduating. million make sense at that point? Well, it it didn't. Not really. So I think was more it you wanted to own a sports team yeah. that is a fun thing and you guys yes. thought you'd be good at it? Y yes. Yeah. Well, my dad loved sports and we love sports. We all played football. Okay. I don't know what we were doing with the basketball team, but it was probably yeah, because yeah. there was no football teams for probably sale. Yeah. And um, it just, we, we just wanted to be in it. My father loved sports. And it was so the, kind of a the 9 million was the entry into the game of owning a sports team. Yes. It wasn't really... Do, was there any analysis on how you make a return on that nine million? Uh, no, not really. No? We just wanted to own the okay, team. Okay, no, that, but that's what I we mean, want we to understand because it's, it's fun. More, it's more, you know, owning a team is it's great. It's more of a vanity play. Sure. And it's and it's but a, you can make and money a, at it though. Well, yeah, you can. You can make a lot of money, yeah. and it's an appreciation play because the okay, team right. will appreciate you. You know, sometimes you make some money one year. Other, now nowadays it's. You know, we always say that you, there's never been a franchise sold for less than it was bought, so because like, there's always there's a, a line of people waiting to get into to sports that have disposable they, money, but they want yes. they want the sports. So, yes. I grabbed a magazine called Worth Magazine, and in there they had an article about what it's what it's like to own a professional team, and they were basically it was a, a warning. It's it's a lot different than coming out of a normal business environment that you come into this this environment. And I thought it was pretty fascinating. It is. Well, it, you, you have to remember a couple things. You have to remember that you, it's very public. Mm -hmm. Everybody knows what you're doing. They all know your business. They all second guess you. They're they have all, an opinion. <laughs> they all have an opinion. And it's yeah. all Monday morning quarterbacks. So yeah, they all, yeah. why didn't you do this? Why didn't you pick this guy? Why did you know? So you get second guessed a lot. Yeah. And um, is that hard to deal with? No, not really, because you just get used to it. We've been in sports for 20-something years. Yeah. Just some, something that we've done. You're good at it, Listen, man. We're pretty good at it. <laughs> so you make money at it now? I mean, yeah, if, we, yeah. if there's, there, yeah, there's a system we, that you figured out, this is how you got to yes. do it to turn a profit while, yes. while your assets appreciating. Yes, well, you know, you know, getting to the Knights, when we brought the Knights, my brother and Joe yep. and I, we sold the Kings, and then we went to see Gary Bettman, the commissioner, and said um, – you know, we'd like to put up a franchise in Las Vegas. And he didn't say yes, but he didn't say no. Mm. And um, so then we knew that MGM was building this, the arena uh, down the way. And they were in a partnership with uh, AEG. It's, you know, hey, you got the venue. Let's put the team there. And there's no team in Las Vegas. Mm -hmm. And um, so one thing led to another. Then back and forth. And we met with Bill Foley. And we brought him the deal. And we went back and forth to... New York about 50 times <laughs> over. It took us five years. Really? Five years. Yes. And it was back and forth. And whoa, we, whoa, we whoa. never knew we were going to have a team. We didn't know. What was the, 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 the block in their minds? Well, they wanted to make sure there was a venue. Okay. That there was a, a pro venue, not going into a, an existing venue, say like Thomas and Mac, which is nice, but it's not a pro venue. Mm -hmm. You have to have the right venue. Just like the Raiders are going in. To a brand new stadium. That's what sports is today. Okay. So the venue was the biggest obstacle, not gambling and all that in Vegas. No, no the venue, venue, the venue. Obviously, that's kind of been the stigma around uh, Las Vegas for so many years is <clears throat> is the gambling aspect of it. But when you look around, every how many states around the country have gambling? Yeah. Now? Maybe all but Hawaii and Utah, mm -hmm. some form of gaming. So now it's, it was it's. It's softened up a lot since when I we started looking at it. So do you, do you look at casinos and sports teams as entertainment, kind of in the same genre, or how do how do you how do you look at this? Yeah, entertainment, exactly what it is. Entertain you're entertaining the guests, you're entertaining the fans. Um, you know, our philosophy, you want to go back and talk to these young people. Yeah. Here's here's a, a great philosophy. 
take care of we we help, we always had two mantras. Our mantra was take care of the customer, you take care of your employees. Over and out. But you know everybody talks about taking care of the customer, but they don't live it like we like we did and like we do. We do anything for for any customer. And uh, I travel around so often and I see great service and I see terrible service. Mm -hmm. And we, we've always prided ourselves on, on taking care of people. And that's what young people, but, but sometimes people, they, they think it's beneath them to cater to somebody. Well, if you think it's beneath you know. to cater to somebody, you, you, better, you better become an accountant. So <laughs> do you spend time in the trenches? Do you actually go and you talk to your clients and you talk to your customers and prospects and, and, and see what's going on? Oh, absolutely. We're always in the trenches. We're, <clears throat> we, uh, with our product, Drink Aid, yep. I go see stores. I'm, I'm visiting with the, the uh, cir uh, cir uh, Circle Ks of the world, mm -hmm. the Terrible Herbs here, uh, Smiths. I go in all the stores, all my brothers do. Because that's the only way you, you find out what what's going on on the streets. you got to get out of the office. Okay, so the ingredients that make this up, do you go talk to the vendors and do you make sure that the vendors are, are, are not cutting corners and that, that what they say they're selling you is, is you know, you're buying and going into this? Well, that, well that, that's a pri proprietary formula. Sure. So that was developed years and years ago by a doctor and a, mm -hmm. a holistic doctor. And, you know, it, it has a lot of up benefits. It helps hydration, drink aid, and, right. and it helps uh, with arthritis. And it also prevents hangovers. That's what I heard. This thing is one <laughs> hell of a hangover cure. <laughs> it's great. Yeah. yeah, you drink one of those per seven drinks, you're okay. Really? If you're going to drink more than seven drinks, you drink two. And after that, you're on your own. Well, yeah, but you know, being in the alcohol business, I guess this is a pretty good thing to have. <laughs> comes, after comes 14, the, I think you you got bigger problems. Comes yeah. with a bottle of Jack. Yeah. <laughs> so when we when we go back to buying the rockets and the mindset of yourself and your family, and then now running a profitable franchise, what things have changed in how you approach it in your mindset in and just the the overall business aspect of it from early on to now and in, in owning teams? I think it's all been pretty much the same. Really? Yeah, I think it has. I think the only thing that's changed is the technology part of it. Now you have everything. You have an app where you can buy tickets. Uh, you can exchange tickets on an app. You know, it's mostly technology, but it's still the basics. You take care of your fans. You take care of your sponsors, whomever is sponsoring the team. Yep. And uh, you do th different things for for your your customers. It's the same thing. It's just technology's gotten so more advanced. What do you think you guys are really good at when it comes to engagement with the fans? Well, we're accessible. <laughs> we always have been. I, I used to say uh, years ago that you, the way you kill a Maloof is put us on a deserted island. <laughs> <laughs> No one to talk to, no one to interact with, because we're people persons. That's we always have been. All my brothers, my sister Adrian, and my mother. Um, so we we love people and we love being around people. And I think that's just the accessibility. Yeah, which then has that human touch and is you know yes. easier to to connect with. How do you, how did it feel when um, because your your team here became so integral in the town getting over the shooting? And kind of embrace the timing and all that. Like we we had on um, Sasha Larkin, the the police captain here, mm -hmm. and she was talking about how much the team meant to the community. And she, you know, she's getting you emotional talking after. about yeah. how great you guys were. And, and you know, how did that feel? Like navigating that? Oh uh, well, I mean, it was it was heartwarming, really. I mean, it was it was incredible because I think the the team came around along the time where, where that group great tragedy happened and it kind of helped people get through some of it as best as you could. Yeah. And then, the, then the team and the fans made this connection and our, that was it. Sold out. It becomes everything. bigger than anything you can imagine, right? It's it, emotional in a different way. It, it does. And it's so great for, for, for people because now they have something to, to hold on to, to look forward to, you know, everyone's looking forward to next so, season. Sure. But it's, it was great for both sides when you have a team though and you're in a community let's say one of the other teams that you're you you had what do you do to get that the glue in the community to come together and support that team and love that team because that's what it's about and it, is winning the key to that 
Because it's no, hard no. to get a community. I, you know what? Chicago Bears. Look at the Chicago <laughs> Cubs. They lose every every uh, every year. Yeah. Losers, but they fill they fill up because there's this love. There's this sense of community around that team, and it was cultivated and built over the years. But every every Bears fan, bro, including yourself, talks about the '85 Bears. Yeah, the winning is what. Sure. Or I don't know you. Well, I'll, let, me, let me let me go back a little bit. Excuse me. Two years ago, when we when we brought the first brought the team here, first of all, I I. You probably won't believe it, but I knew we'd be successful. There wasn't a doubt in my okay. mind. You know, when everybody was saying, well, it's not hockey in the desert, people don't even know hockey out here. Well, I said, well, we're people too. Yeah. You know, you're, people in, in they LA come, don't they, they come all around the world here. I mean, we're yeah. not robots. We want our own team. That, that was the problem. People were following everybody else's team. They, weren't, they wanted their own team. We want our own team. We don't want to follow everybody else's team. So, so I knew that would. That was something there. Okay. That also, we've never had a team, so that right. was a plus. Well, yeah, UNLV, that was kind of like the big thing, right? The well, university. UNLV was great, yeah. you know, and, and they've they've had some ups and downs. They had sure. a, a great run, obviously under Tarkanian, but and people still hold on to that, yeah, which is good, yeah. which is good. But, um, but but I knew it would be successful. But what I didn't know was that we'd win like we did. Mm. I, I didn't I didn't expect it was kind of the perfect storm. New team. You know, unfortunately, so you, the tragedy of yeah. putting it, bringing us together and then winning. That's That was the combination. And, and so when you pick a coach, how do you do that? <laughs> like, what's, your, what's the, what's the, yeah, what's the, the magic yeah. to that? I don't know. Well, Bill, Bill that was kind of Bill's uh, okay. area. He, he picked the coach. But, we, he, you know, I think he was he was leaving the Capitals, or, or, the, or um, Panthers, the, the mm -hmm. Florida Panthers. Gerard was leaving the Panthers and... So it was a good fit. You said you like people, so you must have sat down to dinner with with him and broke bread and got to know him. And like, yeah, what are you looking for? I think you just it's just a lot of it is just chemistry. Can you get along with the coach and, yeah. and the feel that you have for him? And is he a player's coach? Is he a, a stern coach? Is he just? I think it's more chemistry. What's okay. better, a player's coach or a stern coach? They both work. Both work. I, I've always been. More apt to to a player's coach, but I think they're a little bit better because they they interact with the players better. But mm -hmm. but also a, a stern coach is good too. They win, so it just depends. Is it harder with the younger generations for a stern coach to connect? Mm, I think it, it's all and uh, in, in whether or not the coach has respect of the players. So if so he they'll, wins, they'll, they'll follow him because they want to win kind of a thing? Yeah, whatever he's telling them. And, and if it's producing wins, then they're going to buy into mm -hmm. it. If it's and producing they're, losses, they're going to get well, bitter. Well, you know, losses. <laughs> Nothing goes right when you lose, right? When you, when you win, everything's great. When, when you're looking for that star player, do you personally interview him? Do you sit down with him and do you talk to no, that no, person? No, most of the players, Bill does all that. Bill, okay. Bill does that. But I've met, I've seen uh, Mark on many occasions, and he's. I mean, that was great. You've had several different teams, so you kind of, you got you have a feeling for what works and what doesn't work. Well, absolutely. Well, one of the things that let me go back again. What uh, what Gary wanted to do, he wanted to make sure that that an expansion team comes out and doesn't start losing. Mm -hmm. Because what, what's happened in the years past is many of the expansion teams that just come out, it takes them so long to get to the playoffs. It takes them 10, 15 years just to make the playoffs. And the fans get, you know, they get antsy. Yeah. And they get, you know. They, they want a winner. They want a winner. So the, so he, he they made the rules a little bit better for an expansion team to – to try to win right, a, right, a, right to away. To acquire better players and, yes. and coaches. Yes. Um, salary caps, all that stuff. I mean, is that hard to work around? Or you get, no, uh, you get capologists. They get they go through all that. But, really? I, you know, that's, that's not what I do. That's what, that's, that's what I'm trying to figure out is, you're in the, okay, here you got, you're in the liquor business. You're, you're doing all this. And then you go into a pro, the professional team business. And what were the biggest differences that you saw that you had to overcome in the challenges? Well, what's the one thing you remember? That you said, "Jesus, I can't believe this." Well, this again, is it's way it's, different it's, than what I thought it was going to be. It's, it's, uh, it's the, the human factor. I think. Well, a, a lot of players, as you know, have have big egos, which is okay. They yeah. should have big egos. They should think they're the best. If they don't think they're the best, who is going to think they're the best? So you you have to kind of navigate through through that a little bit. But we've always never had a problem with okay. any of the players. All right. Good. 
Do you do you think though that the environment you guys create is different than most teams in that way that you're accessible, that you're, you know, the environment is is more caring? I I, I think that has a little bit to do with it. I think they just you you know you want to give them the tools to win. You want to give all the players the tools to win. That's the, the, whether it's the best coach, the best trainer, the best facilities over here at T-Mobile, the practice facility that we have, you, you give them the best facilities to win, the best thing, tools to win. How important is it on a sports team that there's an expectation to win versus a culture of accepting loss? Like an expansion team, like you were saying, kind of the expectation is they're going to struggle, right? Mm -hmm. So it's an expectation and it's hard to get over that because – the coach and everybody can say, well, we're an expansion team. It's the first year. Like, yeah. how do you, how do you navigate setting a culture where the expectation is higher than what would normally be expected? Well, I think you, you, you always, first of all, it's better to be expected to win than the perennial loser, right? You want, you want that. You want to try to raise the bar each year and, and to, to win each year. That's, that's what sports is all about. And like I like I said, the, the the surprise or maybe I don't know about surprise, but as we won like we did, I mean, if, I mean, who thought we'd go to the Stanley Cup Finals the first year of the franchise? Nobody, because it's never happened. So now you you know you still have to you know you have to continually try to better the team with better players or whatever you you need to do to to draft. What commonalities are there between the NBA and the NHL? Uh, and what differences are there? Are there big differences? I don't, I don't, I don't know that there, there's that many big differences. I think uh, the only difference, really, with the the NHL, really, in um, in in, um, in the arena, does more revenue than the NBA in the arena. Wow. The difference is the TV, because the NBA uh, has a larger television package than the the NHL. That's the only difference. But I think it's basically the same thing. I mean, we play the same amount of games. Um, we have the playoffs. It's, I think it's basically the same, just different people. That's fun. So, casino business. We're talking, we're talking sports. How the heck did you get in the casino business? Like, How did that happen? Well, <laughs> my brother George and I came to Las Vegas about 30 years ago, and we... Um, my father always liked coming to Las Vegas. He used yeah. to take us when we were five years old, and we'd, we'd sit and I'd, I'd sit at the Aladdin and watch that sign remember, go remember, up and remember down. Remember the, the right the, the Aladdin was somewhere out there. I remember I was staying at the Aladdin years and years ago. I was like yes. twenty three or twenty four years old. Yeah, <laughs> and a I long used to sit time in, ago. Yeah. Sit in my room with a babysitter and watch that. Slow. So was baby, your dad gambling? Oh yeah, yeah, he, yeah. What yeah, were he, his games? What did he play? Uh, he liked craps and he liked so he'd roll the dice. Yeah, he liked to throw the dice. Oh. Yeah, he was throwing dice and I was watching the sign. <laughs> <laughs> so when you became of age, did you come and play craps and gamble and? Well, I did. Maybe even don't tell anybody. Maybe a little before my age. <laughs> <laughs> a little before it was legal, but it's all right. I was way back a long time ago. But we've always loved Las okay. Vegas and and. So we wanted to build a casino. My brother George and I came here. That's a big we undertaking. Were like, it was, we're going to build us a casino. It was. It was. And then we, our first one was the Fiesta in North Las Vegas. Okay. We were the first casino ever in, in North Las Vegas. Okay. So, um, so we built that. And what was the cost of that? Fifteen million. And so, do you guys put up the fifteen million? Yeah, borrow, yeah. We put well, we up? put up we put up some money. We borrowed it. Yeah, we and put so, up some. Fifteen million, and now different than the sports team. Is it an ego player? Do you want to make a return on that? No, no, no. You got to make a return. And so yeah. now it's a completely different industry where gambling is psychology and keeping things really tight, right? And watching, and right. it's an attention to detail. Is the attention to detail the same in sports as it is in casinos? I think it, well, casinos it's 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 day by day. I mean, it's, it's or minute by minute, minute right? by minute. My brother, George was here. He practically lived at the Palms and he lived at the Fiesta. So he was there long, long hours and he, he ran that. So, I mean, yeah, it's, it's very detailed because you have, you know, there's a lot of action going on. You got to watch out, you know, who's trying to take from you, what this guy's doing. People and, always trying to steal. 
Oh yeah. yeah. So so I'm fortunately, cheap, yeah. fifteen million. And was it originally planned at fifteen, or were you over budget? Was it over budget? A no, lot? we were. We, we were, were pretty, pretty right on. Pretty, pretty close. And so from the time you open, when are you making a return, or when are you where we, you want to be? We started the first year. I mean, we because we, my brother started with the Royal Flush Capital of the World. But we gave out more. Our, our machines were the loosest in, wow. in the world. So that, that was your motto. Yeah, is that we're was, slutty yeah. machines. <laughs> we, we have the loosest slots. Yeah. Loosest slots. And, yeah, and yeah. so what kind of gambler does that attract? Everybody. Everybody. Yeah. They just wanna, Everybody. You want to win. That's like your lost leader. They get yeah, them in the door. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, yes, it is. And, you know, your whole percentage is maybe 2 or 3%. It's very, very small because you uh, have to. Like overall or just on the slots? Oh, uh, video poker. Oh, video poker. Video poker. Two yeah, or three and even percent. our slots. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, but but locals play video poker. Okay. And you were catering to the locals. Yes, yes. And so that that was a uh, that was a big thing. And then, and so you two percent on the on the slots. And then are you trying to make revenue on food? And uh, how many rooms did you have? We only had a. It was small. It wasn't about the rooms. No, we had 100, 100 rooms. Hundred rooms. Yeah. So then, food. Did you have shows? What? What no, we didn't really. Of... It was most mostly locals. We had great food. So Vegas, out... Vegas was always known for the food. Yeah, you always That's come fair. to Vegas and eat cheap for ninety nine cent buffet yeah. and all this kind of stuff. <laughs> that all stopped, and now they now they they make money everywhere. Yes. Yeah. So that model. So let's talk about that model. So in the beginning, it's about you know cheap food and getting the people in the door, lost leaders. Now Vegas has changed quite a bit. You got this Palms. We're sitting here on this fiftieth floor in this penthouse, and like. What happened? Like how how that transition? Yeah, how happen? do you go from there to yeah? Here? That's pretty exciting. That's a good question. <laughs> so do you sell that casino? Yeah, we sold it. Yeah, and actually, so we what, sold it to the you guys Sell a lot, like you sell your sports. Yeah, we, sell? we 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 buy and sell. We, Is the intention when you start something to sell, or no, you just get to a point in no. a family meeting where you're like, yeah, I don't know, let's do something else? Well, they when they offer you 185 million, you probably wow. Oh, so the sell. offer was yeah. too good to turn down. Yeah. Well, and then we wanted to. We wanted to get something closer to the strip. Okay. But Makes it was sense. great. We did we did we did a great job there at the Fiesta. We we had great employees and we had it really humming. So you sell for 185 million. Yeah. And then how what how much was the palms originally? Uh about 300. And so how much of the that's 185 did you roll into the 300? All of it. <laughs> and so Okay, so All that's good. You're yeah. you're uh, maybe I don't know if it was that much, maybe two twenty. I don't remember. How long well, does it take to build the palms from conception to open? Is it years? Uh, yeah, that's about three years, two three, three years, yeah. Three years. Mm -hmm. And so then when the palms opened, did it do as good? Yeah, it, oh when it opened there was a line we we, we <laughs> with opening night, I don't know, some people have probably been to the opening here we had a line uh all the way on the freeway about a mile down the freeway wow people trying to get in and right. then we caught hell from the press because they said we over marketed it <laughs> and, well, that, it i mean but, you can't over market coke got uh, one of the I think uh, it was 86 olympics they got uh, uh, people were bitching that they over marketed the whole thing do you think that you actually over marketed or you just did a really great job no no there's no such thing as over marketing really i don't think so i i think I think if you're getting the people, yeah, that's what you want, right? You want people. Yeah, it's the, people, yeah, the people that don't know how to market that say you're over marketing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's probably right. Yeah, right. So then, then there's a big change there in the model, right? Because now you're closer to the strip. Now you're not catering to locals. So how does the business model change? Okay, or am I wrong? Well, okay, you're almost right. But we did. We see the, the way this casino is situated. We. Um, Half is catering to locals because we're still because you already the strip. knew that. Yeah, well, we already knew it, but we're off the we were off the strip, and then we had the nightclubs. We had Rain and, and mm -hmm. Ghost Bar and the Nine Steakhouse. We had great food, and then we were marketing to tourists. So we had the best of both worlds. So we marketed to both, and and then we had our, our slots were loose too. Again, not as loose right. as they were in Fiesta, because but we had still, a, but still loose. Yeah. That's but now you're you're bringing in entertainment. You're competing with who? Who was your competition? The Hard Rock at the time? Or hard, did you guys feel everyone, like you had Hard Rock, Wynn, Caesars, Bellagio? But don't, didn't you? Did you lean your demographic? Did it lean a little younger? Yes. And yes, the Hard yeah, Rock yeah. kind of had the younger. They had the young crowd, and, and then we had the young crowd yeah, as well. Which you still we, kind of do, right? Yeah. Well, we 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 had this is when we owned 
the the Kings and we brought players in, you know, all of the NBA came in to, you know, play here. And so we had, we had a, I mean, and once at, at one time, the Palms was the, the greatest spot on earth. I mean, and people, I mean, they, we had everybody here, movie stars, athletes, oh, yeah. rock stars. It was, it was it. What, what was the biggest change between the Fiesta and the Palms that you went, wow, wow, this is different. This is different. Um, I think it, because the Fiesta was in the local area, yeah. just a local. Sure. They're, they're called a grind joint. That's what they're okay. kind of called. Okay. They're called it because you do volume. Okay. And it's people that usually come in and spend ten, twenty dollars a day. Okay. And this is this is different. So, you, so your you, margins are bigger. It's people are spending more. You have bigger well, whales and that sort well, of. Well, there's thing. no whales at the Fiesta. I'm guessing, right? Or no, there's you, no whales. But no. now here, you're trying to attract whales. Well, not that big of a whale. Okay. We don't want. No? We don't want no. Because they can put your put your lights out. We oh, don't, really? We don't want the guy that's no. We, the, I think the biggest line we ever had was half a million or a million. That's the high end. Yeah, that's you don't want them because they, they they win too. Yeah, and they can hurt you. They're, they're not. So what's know, your so, what's your biggest loss for the day and biggest win for the day? It was probably a million. Yeah, a million both ways. Yeah, wow. What do you what do you when you first opened? What did you want to do a day on average in gambling revenue? I, no, I remember no. when the Mirage opened up. They were saying, oh, they, uh, he has to do a million dollars a day or he yeah, can't get yeah. the doors open. He's crazy. Right. It's never going to work. Bellagio and then, has another then, number. Right. Then he gets the, the, whatever, the, the place next door with the Pirates, the Treasure Island or whatever the hell that is. And then he went and did that. That's one hell of a story. I mean, were you rooting for the Mirage? Oh, of course. Yeah. Of course. Yeah. Now, Gavin, that number, if they say that the the Mirage has to do a million a day, is that a million in revenue? But it's not the net, right? No, no, that's not the net. So how much are they netting off the million? Uh the they're probably making twenty percent. So a couple hundred two, thousand. Couple hundred. So really what they need to do is a couple hundred a day in profit to profit to yeah. make it go. Right. So twenty percent. Yeah, I think it's how has uh, how has the the casino business changed the, the gaming business now they call it uh, from twenty years ago to now. I mean, other than there's you know, Indian reservations and, and this stuff, but the model has changed a lot. The days of you know the cheap buffets and all this stuff. Now the entertainment, the food, everything is being charged for. I mean, when did that shift happen? And how did you deal with it? Uh, well, Mike, actually, if you gamble, they still give you a lot of free stuff. Yeah, you should try it with me sometime. No. <laughs> no. Come to the Irish gambling drinking side of things. I'll, 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 I'll hang out with you, you one day. They give you free rooms and all kinds of yeah. stuff. Yeah, I, I think yeah, they still do, but they but they've cut back on the comps. You know, I think a little bit. Even if you play, they. But um, now they're making money on everything else, so they want to so make. You look money at everything on, now. You know, you look at everything. Yes. So you're making money at the pool. You're making money. I think one of the mistakes that that the, I think one of the big mistakes that they made. This is just me. Is is charging for parking? I mean, I think that that yeah. was a big mistake, because think about it. The guy's coming in to play in your your establishment. You so you got to charge him for park. Well, look, let me back up. He comes in. He wants to get a, uh, some dinner, so he's mm -hmm. going to have dinner. Then maybe he's going to play a little bit. Now he loses. He eats dinner, and he, then he loses. Then he goes outside. Now he's got to play for pay for parking. He just lost <laughs> two, three hundred dollars. Like getting kicked so to the curb. Kicked to the curb. Yeah, so those did, little a lot things. of people are angry. Yeah, it's, yeah. It's, it's not. I don't think it's it's good for the city. So it's always been free parking. What do you see the city going in the future? What, what's the future for 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 the Palms? Is there going to be? Well, you started with the Fiesta and then the Palms, and now is there going to be another big? Thing in the works that you you're thinking about? We have a, a tele technology company called Staxos, and we source and solution for many major uh, companies in the world, some multi billion dollar companies okay. in the world. So this is our technology. So you're, you're We're doing really well. So you're moving away from gaming and getting into the tech world, which I know nothing about. <laughs> but you knew nothing about the casinos when you did. When you no, about I didn't casino. know anything about that either. All right. So, but so you, I'm learning on the fly. <laughs> but I just know. But you, I know you my adapt very quickly. Yeah. yeah. But uh, but uh, but my people know what what to do. And okay. uh, we have a uh, I have a great partnership with uh, a gentleman by the name of Nick Wilson who started the company, and then Robbie Vega, whose family's from La, uh, Las Vegas, Vega Enterprises. They used to call on us, so we've been lifelong friends for 25 years. So I jumped into this to to their company okay. a, a couple few years ago, and we're we're doing re really well. What do they exactly do? 
we source and solution for big companies. So let's say a company X wants uh, an SD WAN. We do everything technology SD WAN. We do uh, connectivity. We do uh, the cloud. So you're all, all the Wi Fi AI now and all that oh, stuff. Wow. Yeah, we have 300 partners worldwide that we deal yeah. with Verizon, AT&T, uh, T-Mobile, Rackspace, uh, Macergy, it goes on and on. And then we don't charge the customer with free service. We get paid a small percentage on the back end. Interesting. Yeah. And so we, so I started in, in that. We're, we're, we're making some big waves. And we're doing really well. What, what is it in your, in your approach and mindset that allows – you to go into industries you don't know and be successful what are the things that are common from the different industries the approach i i, I don't know what it is i mean we we <laughs> we were in skateboarding too my brother you were started the maloof money cup and skateboarding joe oh, wow. and uh, i don't know what it is it's 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 we keep reinventing ourselves and um we i think a, a couple things is we we know who People, we know people. We know who the good people are. We know who the people to stay away from. Okay. And so we try to align ourselves with the good people, and I think that's that's important. And then you. Where'd you learn that from? Uh, uh, who taught just you? Just along the way, my father. Remember when I was, you know, I was start, I started working at. Here's mm -hmm. another thing, young people. You know, you got to work. You can't just expect. <laughs> you're not you know, entitled they, they, to. No, you're not entitled. Yeah, yeah, you know. You don't just wake up and hope things are going to happen. You got to work, just like we did. You know, I was uh, ten years old and in Albuquerque. I was sweeping the warehouses, loading trucks, and my dad used to tell me. He says, "I'm not giving you anything." He says, "I'll leave all this to charity. If you don't work, you're not getting a dime." So shoot, I had to go to work. I, do you think I wanted to work? No, no, I didn't no want to work. And and we, you know, all the holidays. Think about it. Um, all the holidays, we sold liquor, we sold booze. Beer, wine, those were our major holidays. Well, that's that's when your money making days. Yeah, and that's when you're off of school. I never had a day off, really. When yeah. when when it came along for Christmas or New Year's, we were working. Fourth of July, Memorial Day, Labor Day, those were our big holidays. Did, did you eat dinner as a family? Did you talk business as a, as a, at we, the dinner table? We did. We did. Yeah. What would your yes. dad pay you? Oh, <laughs> was it minimum? You want to hear this one? Yeah. Well, okay. Well, my brother Joe and I worked all week. I was like 14, I guess. And my uncle Tom says, okay, go give me two Chris $20 bills. So he gave me a $20 and he gave my brother Joe a $20 for all week. I mean, we must have worked 70 hours. What but did he you could. say? Well, I, was this it? <laughs> Is this all? And uh, he said, that's it, yeah. But, but I think he just was trying to instill in us and – and when you ask why, well, the way we grew up, we grew up with the common man. We grew up with the blue collar guy. Yep. We were with them since I was 24, 14 years, 10 years old. So I understand people. I know what makes people tick I, because I was loading trucks just alongside yep. with them. So a lot of people, though, Gavin, are you familiar with the term the Peter Principle, where you perform to your own incompetence? No. I so it's a, it's a saying, but you know, like say a CFO in a company comes out of college, he's an accountant and he goes to work for a, a fortune 500 company and works his way up and he's really good at it and he loves it and he's hanging out with other accountants and they're creating new ideas. And all of a sudden after 20 years, he becomes a CFO of a company and then he never misses the street and he's really good at it. And they're like, Oh, you know, Gavin's really good. So we're going to make him the CEO and he becomes the CEO and he fails miserably because everything that was attached to his ego and everything he understood about accounting, now you're in charge of sales and you can't run it. You know, there's a magic and an alchemy to sales and marketing mm -hmm. and different things, and it's not accounting. So the things that you hold dear to yourself and that are attached to your ego end up being your enemy when you get promoted or you move up. So what? How? how have you... How has the family been successful in the approach? What is what is the recipe in the approach where you're not you're going into so many different industries, but you're not hitting that ceiling where your experience ended up being the thing that's holding you back in the other venture? Is it ego? Well, uh, I don't know how to answer that exactly, but all all I can tell you is that um, we you know I learned long ago you can't make some. 
somebody something that they're not. Like, you can't let's say change the, the, people. You, you can't change them and you can't elevate a person that's not elevatable, if that's a word. Because they don't see it in themselves, so you're not going right. to change them. Right, and, and some, you know, we used, to, we used to have a philosophy, too. We want to promote from within, and we used to do that all the time. We used to promote from within, mm -hmm. but, we, but then we, later on we had to say when possible. Right. So if somebody was doing a great job and they, they were a salesman and they wanted to promote to a manager or a general manager, sometimes they just want to be a salesperson. They don't want to be a manager. Or they're not capable of managing people. So you, I think that's, there's, there's a yeah. trick there to, to know everybody's limitations, what their capabilities are. And I, and I think that's what we've been, we've been good at. Is, and we, we, we try to promote people from within, but sometimes you just can't. How does, how does the family dynamic work? Because I've always been a fan and envious of your brothers and how you guys always seem like you're on the same page and you're all for one, one for all. I have two brothers. Mm -hmm. And one time when they were younger, I sat them down and I said like, hey, you know, we're brothers. We're actually half brothers. We have the same dad. And I said, you know, we could do amazing things in business if, you know, we made a pact together. And it just didn't work. Like, I don't know, white, white people are for some reason... <laughs> We just fight and they don't want to work and they don't show up. And they're, you know, they're always, they're always mm. feeling like they're getting the short end of the stick and that they're entitled to something that doesn't exist. How, how has, what did your father do or your grandfather do that created a culture or your in mother. the family? My mother, yeah. Yeah, my yeah. mother. Well, my, what's that my, magic? My, 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 my mother and my father used to tell us, okay, there's five siblings. It says, which finger do you not want? And so, you know, kind of resonated wow. with this. It we said my, and yeah. my dad would sit, sit down and say, you know, as long as you all get together, you start fighting, the company doesn't exist. Yeah. You start, now, do we have arguments? Do we have fight? Yeah, we fight. But at the end You're of the brothers. day. brothers. We're brothers, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Okay, we're going to have arguments. We're going to have differences. But yeah. at the end of the day, we move forward and we fight the competition. And I, we, we never really understood, you know, why am I fighting? I'm not, I'm not here to fight my brother. I'm here right. to fight, like in Coors, sure. well, I'm here to fight Budweiser or Bacardi. I'm here to fight Myers. You know, I'm here to fight, yeah. you know, the, the, competition. the competition. That's who we need to fight. We don't need to fight ourselves. I, I could never understand why, why brothers feel like that. I don't, it's just never been in our culture. Do you guys um, separate everything evenly? And is responsibility and money... How can you how can you separate responsibility and pay and revenue the same because they don't ever seem to match do they or do they Well we do everything as a family you know we might have a I might have a side thing here and mm -hmm. one of my brothers has a side but mostly we divide it up five ways well, And so does the responsibility go five ways No well, well well, everybody has their own lane Is there one like, brother that isn't doing anything that's in Ibiza No dancing and no. collecting <laughs> a check no, no, no. Everybody's everybody. everybody's working. Look at my my brother Philip. He's out hitting stores. George is killing himself over this over drink aid. You know, I'm I'm working the technology company. Joe's working the drink aid, and then we have investments too. But we all work. Well, we don't have to work. You know, I don't. I don't. I was just. <laughs> I took a trip to uh, Cancun the other day, and I. You know, I'm looking at the beach. I said, "Okay, it's great for three, four days. I got to yeah. get back." Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I mean, well, I mean, how, how how do you just stay there for years and years? I, I just never. Uh, Mike's computed. Mike's getting better at it. I'm I'm like you. <laughs> yeah. I yeah. after three days, I, I want to get to work. Me, my max about twelve days I can handle. Yeah. And, and as I'm really, really pushing, and usually what ends up happening, I have to go to two places. I, I'll stay in one place for like one week, and then I get on a plane and go to another place for another week. Uh, just to change the venue to, to mix it up. But he, he's good. And he's turning off the phone. He's I'm getting he's, better. Um, I'm getting, oh, but it's, it's, it's recent it's a, that he's been able yeah, to do it, that. It, it's, right. a, it's a lot of work to do that. It it, it took yeah, it, to train my mind to do that. It, it takes it it takes a while. And I've talked to folks who've been retired and they and uh, they made money when they're young. And every single one of them went back to work. They they said, oh yeah, I just oh. eat lunch. I kept eating and eating. I gained weight. I got out of shape and. You know what else am I going to do? And they go. Everyone goes back. Most everyone goes back to work. So I just figure I'm going to work till the day yeah. I die. Yeah, you know, yeah. you know, Mike, and, and that's that's true. Is well, you know what? 
What, what do you do if when you retire? I I, I think when you Start retire, die. You, you die. You die. Yeah, they say the average die. the average yeah. lifespan of someone who retires is like six point some years. It's a very blue collar oh, yeah. mindset. Uh, so yeah. so don't yeah just no. keep working. Just keep working. I can't. And then it keeps your mind fresh. It does. And you, 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 Exciting. Think it's, it's, yeah, we wake up to fun. hunt. Whatever it is, even if you know you want something to do, yes. something to chase. Yeah, and, and then we we like challenges. Like this was a challenge with going with Staxos, and and this. I wanted to, to get into a, a field that I knew nothing about. I mean, we're the, probably the least technology comp family that you'll ever meet. I can't screw in a light bulb. So, but we wanted to, <laughs> we wanted to take on this as a, yeah. as, a, as a challenge but, and that we can get into to a field that we know nothing about and be successful. Well, you've done it before, so why not again? True. Yeah. What, what would you say to your 24-year-old self if you went back about work-life balance? Because that's a term that people love Work to throw life around. Work-life balance. I don't know that I'd, I'd. I don't know that I'd say too much to myself at 24. Was I was raised pretty well. My my mother, my father. They. I thought they raised me pretty good, but. Um, I really wouldn't tell myself anything differently. I think it's just there's people are always looking for the silver bullet for the magic wand. There is no magic wand. You have to work hard. You have to have a product that you believe in, and you got to go 100 percent at it. And you got to focus. If you if you deviate from that focus, you're not going to be successful. And and anything that we that we venture, the people that we have that are running that company have to have 100 percent focus, or you're not going to be successful because you got to fight the competition. Yeah. And they're they're focused. You got to be better than the competition every successful person that i know that's super successful there is no work-life balance it's it's their focus the wrong on, question yeah it's like yeah. it's all about it's like retirement what they're doing yeah people well, that talk about right, work-life balance that. talk about retirement i always said that work-life you know it's, it's nonsense at least in my world it has been it's about yeah, having right. a lofty goal and going after it with some it's passion nice to think about it yes, it's yes, nice to think hard. about it but i don't know um, and yeah. i think a lot of young people again you know you have to pay your dues in life you can't just Go from here to the top. Oh, you know they want to. They want to move up quickly. You know it's a. You have a long life. You know, people are living till ninety, a hundred today. Hopefully. Uh, oh but, yeah. But you know, you pay your dues and work your way up. There is no easy button. No easy button. No. no. What, what, so one last question. What What advice would you give? And if it's not yourself, to somebody else, twenty four, about love and relationships and business balance. Well, I, I think. Obviously, relationships are great, and if you love somebody, that's fan, that's fantastic. But I think too, if you if you depends on what your goals are. I mean, if you you want to you want to run a business, you gotta, you know, we always come from family first. That's we've always, but, but business yeah, is, is part of the family. Yeah, a, well, part of the family, yeah. Well, part of the family. One one uh, A and one A. So mm -hmm. they're they're right there. Uh, I I think just just work hard. Make sure you have whatever you're selling or whatever you're doing. Make sure you have 100% focus. Know your craft and then stick with it. A lot of times people, they, they jump, they're, they're on one, one thing, then they jump to this thing and they're all, they mm -hmm. keep looking around. But if you have a product or something that, you're, that is really going well, stay, yep. stay with it and 100% focus. I agree. My question to you is how did you stay working when you were young and it, it was little motivation that you know as far as you didn't know that you were going to get into investments of palms the uh hockey i was at the draft too i was i showed up there so that was cool um but yeah what kept you working what kept you my dad <laughs> <laughs> my dad with the whip <laughs> no <laughs> pops uh well just just that i i well, I've, I've always had a great deal of respect for my parents, my mother. My dad passed away a long time ago, but my mother, she, she really really took, took over and was a strong woman. And she always, she never, she never wanted to quit. She never, she always wants a, a new thing going. She wants us to get involved in business. She, she, when we're not. She encouraged you. She encouraged yeah. us. Yeah. And, and when we're. Sometimes we were. A lot of parents don't encourage their kids to get into business. They try to talk them out of it. Yeah, no, that's, that's it's, just it's, the opposite. It's crazy. Yeah, yeah. It's and so we were working at a young age, and I, I always knew that I wanted to to be involved with the beer business and the liquor business because that's what we did. But you know, we worked our tails off. I mean, he, 
I mean, we were there at six to like midnight every day, loading trucks. You know, I didn't want to do that. Right. But I just, but I had to. Otherwise, I wouldn't, wouldn't have. Right. All of my family. That, business. Yeah, that is good. That is good because my pops, he actually owned a business too. So he was the same thing. You know, it was like, boy, you better get up. You better do something. You know, I mean, so from a young age, I was like that. So it's, do you, would you say that that's, that's a key motivation in just in life, period, or just in yes. business? How? Yeah, and I'm going to tell you another thing. Yes, at both. Okay. You know, and, and I think one of the things that my father liked about sports, it's so much like business, it's so much like life. You you never quit. And w- when you quit once, you quit the rest of your life. Mm-hmm. You, my dad used to tell me, you know, wow. don't quit one because I, I, I was going to college and I said, Hey dad, you know, why do I have to go to college? I I know what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna come in and run the businesses. Mm-hmm. Is if you quit college, you'll 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 quit the rest of your life. Uh, my question for you is, what did you want to be when you, like, grew up, like, when you were little? I'm a, I was a little different because I'm not tall. <laughs> so I knew I, I, I love sports. So I, I played sports my entire life. But I was always an overachiever. I was like a Rudy. <laughs> but, you know, but, uh, uh, but I, I knew I wasn't going to be in sports. I, like I said, I always felt that I would run my dad's business. And, uh, and that's why he worked us so like he did because he wanted he says how do you know the top if you don't know the bottom yeah you have to you have to know the bottom to know the top and so, and then he didn't want anybody point fingers and say well look what this kid you know they just promoted him to president yeah, he silver get, spoon silver yeah. spoon he doesn't know what he's doing then they can't bs me because i know because right. i was working harder than they were so i know how long it takes to load a truck i know uh, the deliveries uh, i know when they're screwing off I mean, you know, you know what it's like to wake up with a sore back from loading the truck. Like, yeah, you know what it is. Yeah, commitment. So, so we, so I always knew the bottom, and there was never really a question of what I wanted to do. Just then we started getting fanning out, uh, if if you will, other businesses. There is something to be said about dying after you retire, if you will, right? Because you're not busy anymore. I'm curious if maybe there's a creative passion that that anybody might have, or you might have that becomes work to you you know starts off as creative passion because i i don't i don't get the impression that technology is your passion and you're going to retire in that fashion and work forever in technology so what is that next reconstitution of of you or the maloof brothers if you will i do enjoy what i'm doing now with the technology because it's different it's something that i i didn't know anything about i'm learning as we go and we have, I have a couple of great partners that, that know what they're doing. They've been in it for, they have 40, 50 years of intellectual property, so they know what they're doing. And um, I think we can take that to the sky's the limit. There's, okay. there's, no, there's no stop there. So would you say business is your art? Business, yeah, I would say. Well, I play guitar, too. Oh, you do? Uh-huh. <laughs> so, okay. So there you go. I'll throw so that, well, you I'll, play guitar. Well, right? a little bit. I, okay. I, I, actually, it's probably one of the best things I ever did. I, I took it up four years ago. Okay. And um, so you. How has it helped you? Well, I just love it because I, I play two, three hours a day. I practice. I have a teacher. Oh, and good. So I'm learning. It's very difficult. <laughs> yeah. Hard to play an instrument. It's really yeah. hard. But, but, I, but it also, uh, plasticity in the brain, it, it helps your brain. Yeah, yeah, and I look forward to it every night. I go home and. Oh, wow. My dogs don't like it, but. Eh, <laughs> it's okay, though. <laughs> a lot of my friends are rock. Rock and rollers, rockers. Uh, DJ Ashba is a good friend of mine. Okay. I was just in his studio. We were there the other day. I I'm, my ears are still hurting, but yeah. it's it's been great. So you love really music. enjoyed it. Yeah. Love music. Yeah, yeah. I do. Yeah. And I, it, it's kind of, you know, I've, I've it's always relaxing. been in sports, but I never really got into music, and now I I do that. Is it kind of like therapy for you? Kind of therapeutic. Yes, yeah. yes absolutely. Good. It's yeah. good. I, I encourage. Yeah. I encourage every young person pick up an instrument. Doesn't matter what it is, mm-hmm. and then. Stay with it. Stay with it. A lot of don't people quit. pick it up. Don't quit. Don't quit. Mike, you need to start playing guitar. That's the lesson <laughs> here. That's the lesson, huh? Yeah. Can you tell me more about your hangover drink? Have you tested it out yourself personally with all your rock and roll friends? <laughs> <laughs> yes. Okay, yeah. Well, um, yeah. <clears throat> Our drink, drink aid is, was actually developed by uh, Dr. Dowling, who was a, a medical doctor and a holistic doctor. And he, he actually developed it for lupus. And really? the, the founder of this company, Parrish Whitaker, his, his uh, sister had lupus, 
and she tried all these different remedies and nothing really seemed to help. And she drank this formula and she was, she's been in remission for like 14 years now. Wow. And it helped, but the, the, the funny, not the funny part, but uh, odd part about it, the doctor never drank alcohol. So he never knew that you would what never know that it prevented hangovers. It's just, well, he never had one. Yeah. He never had a hangover. So we, so Parrish was drinking this with his sister one day and he's drinking alcohol and woke up the next day feeling fine, gave, made a big batch, gave it to his friends. They felt fine. Hey. So then he saw my brother Philip at a liquor convention and said, hey, I got something that prevents hangovers. And he brought us that. You have two different ones here. One so says the, prevention and then one is uh, boost. Yes. The red is uh, caffeine free. Oh, okay. And the other one, the boost is caffeine. Okay. So that like the blue one is... Two point two cups of coffee, and it's it's all it's all good for you. Oh, B4, really? B four, B twelve, Guda Cola, green tea extract. It's, it's good for you and it hydrates you. Oh, so, so that's that's our that's drink, not, and we're, we're doing formula. really well with that. We're I've in, tried this one. I like it. Yeah, we're in probably I mean, twelve thousand stores. Wow. Yeah, that's great. And so we fo focus mainly on the Southwest. We're doing great in Texas, of course. Here in, in Nevada, we're in all the gift shops throughout Nevada. Yeah. And uh, California and home for. Now this the the drink business, beverage business, is an entirely different animal. That's, that's, that's another that's, that's another a, one, right? I know. They're all tough. Yeah. They're all tough. But we, we, we have a great product and you know, it's taken some time to you know, we'll we'll probably make some money this year, but it, it takes time. All right. It takes time, but uh, it but but it's really selling. It sells on its own. It's good. Thank you so much, Gavin. Yeah, thank you. It was great, great having job. you here. Thank you, Great advice. Thank, you, thank you for having me. Outlaws, you know why you should subscribe? Because this is fucking awesome. It's about the community. It's about learning. We don't make any money doing this, and we want you to be part of our journey. So hit the like button, subscribe, or leave comments below. And if they're a great comment, we're going to answer it.